guys, it's Miss Miklos. Um, I'm so sorry I couldn't be with you today, um, but hopefully this quick review helps you out. Um, on the review quiz formula sheet, um, it's really specific. It'll even tell you what problems you should use specific formulas on. So all the formulas I'm going to talk about in this, um, don't worry, they will be given to you. So I wanted to start back in chapter six, um, talking about the law of sines and law of cosines. And just a reminder, um, the way we determine which of those formulas we should use is based on how many angles we're dealing with. So in this case, I'm only talking about one angle here. So I'm thinking that we should use the law of cosines. If we're talking about two angles, then the law of sines would be the better option. Um, just a reminder, law of sines and law of cosines are two of the formulas that we use to solve non-right triangles. So I've gone ahead and filled out our formula here. And the key thing for us to remember with law of cosines is that this angle and this side need to be opposite from one another. So it doesn't always need to be C. It could be angle A and side A, angle B and side B. But in this case, C is actually what's given to us. So when I go ahead and substitute everything in, um, something really nice happens, and I notice that side C is all by itself. So I can go ahead and put everything on the right side of the equation straight into my calculator. The one thing I want to caution you guys on is I believe that most of your calculators are currently in radian mode. And if we look in this particular problem, we need to be in degree mode. So as you guys take this quiz, you do need to be aware of what mode your calculator is in. And I know in this case, I need to be in degree mode because it says 45 degrees. When I put this in my calculator, um, I get 40 point whatever, and I'm keeping that exact value, and then I'm going to go ahead and square root that answer, and I get C equals 6.37 or 6.4. And so that would be my final answer. In this next problem, um, I noticed that we have two angles, so I'm thinking we should use law of sines. So here's our law of sines formula. And just a reminder that it doesn't matter if our angles are in the numerator or if our sides are in the numerator. I just need to be consistent. And notice I've used angle A and angle B, but we really could use the ratios of any angles and their opposite sides. So I'm going to go ahead and substitute in the information that we know, and then I need to cross multiply. I need to get side B by itself, so I'm going to divide both sides by the sine of 30 degrees. And then this is something that I'm going to go ahead and put straight into my calculator. And when I put this in my calculator, um, just a reminder to use parentheses when applicable, and I get 19.7 as my answer. The next topic we saw in chapter six was dealing with vectors. And on the quiz, we're gonna see some magnitude, some addition, some dot product. So we're gonna start um, with this symbol right here, which is our symbol for magnitude. And here is our vector. So our vector um, has our x component and our y component. And we know that the magnitude just means the length. So technically, if we think about this, this vector is in quadrant one and it's going to the right five and up 12. And the actual length is the hypotenuse. So we notice that this is actually a right triangle and I can use Pythagorean theorem. And I end up getting that 13 is our magnitude here. When I'm adding vectors together, all I'm going to do is add their x components together, so 3 plus negative 2 is 1, comma, then add their y components together, 1 plus 4 is 5. And that would be our answer. So don't make vectors harder than they need to be. Probably the toughest part with vectors um, was our dot product. Okay, our dot product, what we're going to do is multiply my x components together plus multiply the y components together. So I have negative six plus four, which ends up giving me negative two. So kind of a weird idea here, 
but um, our dot product ends up just being a constant value. Next up, we have our two by two and three by three systems. And um, I'm not gonna go through a specific example here, but I just want to remind us of all the methods that we've learned to solve these. And here's a quick list. Um, intersect, substitution, elimination, Gauss-Jordan, Kramer's rule, and using an inverse. Now, um, for two by two systems, I think substitution and elimination are definitely the easiest way to go. Um, we learned those all the way back in Algebra 1. Kramer's rule is um, pretty easy as well for both 2x2s and 3x3s. And I just want to remind us that I know something is a solution if it makes a true statement when I substitute it back in. We talked a lot about matrices in Chapter 7. And so if we start going through some matrices here, um, we have three major rules. We said that we can go ahead and switch any two rows and their equivalent. We can multiply one row by a constant value, or we can multiply a row by a constant value and add it to the other row. So this was one of the things that we dealt with where we tried to determine, okay, what actually happened? So looking here, it looks like row one is the same. So that means I did not just switch the two rows um, and I, I didn't change row one at all. So obviously I changed row two here. First thing I would see is, okay, did I just multiply by something to make this row into this row? So if that was the case, four times something would give me negative two, and that'd be four times negative one half. And unfortunately, if I keep going along, two times negative one half is negative one, and that's not what is written there. So I know that that is not what happened. So I'm thinking that we added something to row two um, in order to change it. So I have to think, what would I have had to add to four to make it negative two? And that would have been negative six. I know three times negative two gives me negative six. So I'm thinking maybe we did negative two row one plus row two. So let's just check this out. Okay, negative 2 times 3 plus 4 gives me negative 2. Negative 2 times 1 plus 2 gives me 0. So far, this is looking good. And then, negative 2 times 0 plus negative 1 is negative 1. So my answer here is negative 2 row 1 plus row 2. When we're adding matrices together, I'm just adding the corresponding entries. So 1 plus 3 gives me 4. 2 times, I'm sorry, 2 plus negative 1 gives me 1. Sorry, my cat is walking across my screen here. Um, okay, 0 plus 2 is 2. 1 plus 0 is 1. So this would be my answer. When we multiply, though, I do need to think a little bit differently. Okay, a sub 1, 1, um, if we remember what that means, this notation means row 1, column 1. So row 1, column 1, it would be this spot. And it's also telling me I need to multiply row 1 by column 1. So I'm going to do 1 times 3 plus 0 times negative 1, and I get 3. A sub 2, 1 means row 2 times column 1, and it's going to go right there. So I'm going to do 2 times 3 plus 1 times negative 1. So I get 6 minus 1, which is 5. A sub 1, 2 means I'm going to do row 1 times column, sorry, row 1 times column 2. There we go. So 1 times 2 plus 0 times 0 gives me 2. And then lastly, a sub 2, 2 means I'm doing row 2, column 2. 2 times 2 plus 1 times 0 gives me 4. So that would be our answer. 
next chapter, we dealt with sequences and series. Um, and looking at this, if it's asked me just to find the first five terms, I'm going to go ahead and find a sub 1. Notice 1 is in the spot of n. So I'm going to go ahead and substitute in. 3, minus, 3 times 1 is 3 minus 1 is 2. a sub 2 would be 3 times 2 minus 1, which is 5. a sub 3 is 3 times 3 minus 1, which would give us 8. a sub 4, 3 times 4 minus 1, which is 11. And a sub 5 is 3 times 5 minus 1, which gives me 14. So 2, 5, 8, 11, 14 would be my answer here. There we go. Um, now, sometimes we have a specific type of sequence, an arithmetic sequence, which means we had a common difference. We added each time to get to the next term or geometric, which meant we had a common ratio, so we multiplied each time to get to the next term. So this next problem, I wrote one that is arithmetic. Our arithmetic formula, a sub n equals a sub 1 plus n minus 1 times d. And what makes this one kind of tough is they start with the second term. So I'm going to make this the first term. This is like when we just fast forwarded in our sequence. And that means 15 would become the fourth term. So I'm going to say 15 equals 3 plus 4 minus 1 times d. So 15 equals 3 plus 3d. So 12 is 3d. So 4 ends up being my common difference. So what I can do with that now, um, if I know that 3 is the second term, I can just add 4 to get to those next terms. Um, and going backwards, I could subtract 4. And this would be our answer. If it's geometric, I know we have a common ratio. Our common ratio is any term divided by the previous term. So in this case, our answer is 2. So if I'm finding the first five terms, I know 4 and 8. I know the term after 8 would be 16 because I'm multiplying it by 2. And if I'm going backwards, I would have to divide by 2. So I would get 2 and then 1. Okay, um, final thing here to find the sum. This is an arithmetic um, sequence. I can tell that because um, of the way the formula looks. If I was unsure... I can just find any three consecutive terms and see what's happening. Okay, so my first term would be 3 times 1 plus 2, which is 5. 3 times 2 plus 2, which is 8. 3 times 3 plus 2, which is 11. So I can see I'm adding by 3 each time. Okay, so our formula s sub n equals n over 2 times a sub 1 plus a sub n. So I'm finding the sum of 8 terms because it's telling me I'm going from the first term to the 8th term. So I'm going to say 8 over 2. I already found that my first term here is 5, and our nth term is going to be the 8th term. So I need to figure out, okay, well, the 8th term is 3 times 8 plus 2 which is 26. So I have 4 times 31 here. So I would get 124 as our answer. The final thing that's going to be on the quiz from this chapter um, is our binomial theorem. So yes, I could just do 2x minus 1 times 2x minus 1 times 2x minus 1. But what I'm going to do instead, I'm going to, I'm going to start by finding um, our binomial coefficients. And I could do this either by creating Pascal's triangle. I know since this is 3, um, I need to have 4 terms. So this row right here is going to give me those terms. So I have 1, 3, 3, 1. We could also have found that by doing 
3 combination 0 all the way up to 3 combination 3 and we would get those same numbers in our calculator. Okay, next I'm going to take this first term, 2x, and I'm going to take it to the third power and then to the second power, to the first power, and then to the zero power. Then I'm going to take my negative 1 and take that to the 0, 1, 2, and I can write it 3. Now let's simplify. I get 8x cubed minus 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12x squared. It became negative because of that negative 1. Okay, then my next I have 6x and then lastly minus 1. Next, I just want to do some identifying problems with conic sections. So don't stress, there's no characteristics on the quiz today. It's just going to ask us if we can identify them. So let's just go through some quick ones. If I had like x squared plus y squared minus 2x equals 5, we know this would be a circle because both x and y are squared. They're added together and they have the same coefficient. Okay, next, what if we had something like um, 3x squared plus 4y squared equals 12? I know that this is going to be an ellipse because even though both x and y are squared and they're added together just like our previous problem, this time they have different coefficients. So that is going to make it an ellipse. Okay, if I had 3x squared equals 4y squared plus 12, we might be tricked into thinking this is an ellipse right away. But I know the first thing I need to do is actually get my like terms on the same side. So I end up getting that this is a hyperbola because we have the subtraction. And last but not least, what I think is the easiest one to identify. Um, whenever I see that I only have one variable squared, I know it has to be a parabola. For polar stuff, it's going to be just identifying as well. And it's going to be real basic. Okay, so let's start with something like um, r squared equals 4 cosine 2 theta. Um, as soon as I see that r squared and that 2 theta, I'm thinking right away that that needs to be a lemniscate. Remember that was like our little like bow tie looking graph. Okay, if I have something like r equals 3 cosine 2 theta, I'm thinking that this is going to be a rose because um, the, the major difference here is that it's just r instead of r squared. Okay, if I have something like r equals 6 sine theta. This might look like a rose, but we actually know that it is a circle because our n value is 1. Okay, by n I'm referring to the um, coefficient of theta. And then lastly, if I had something like r equals 2 minus 3 sine theta, I know that this is a limosome. And yes, it is an inner loop, but um, on the quiz, it doesn't matter if you know what type it is. It's just going to talk about, um, like, in general, if it's, a, if it's a limosone or not. The final few questions on our quiz are going to refer to limit stuff. So I'm actually not going to go through that because we just took our test on it, and you guys did really well. Um, but hopefully this quick review um, just helps you feel confident and ready to do your best. So good luck, have fun taking it, and all you can do is your best, guys.